Hi, this is Dr. Mehta, and this is a brief overview of professional identity formation, a journey where we learn to think, act, and feel like physicians. In this overview, we'll go over the following concepts. Firstly, we'll look at Piaget's concepts of uh, childhood cognitive development. Next, we'll take a look at some external factors that influence our identity as we grow up and as we progress through our profession. The next concept is very closely related to mindfulness or becoming self-aware and becoming aware of these influences uh, and how it is a key step in our professional identity formation journey. Next, we take a look at Keegan's concepts of adult development and the stages we go through as adults. We look at Miller's Pyramid, the concept of competence, and how this can be related to professional identity formation. And finally, how becoming aware of yourself and all these external influences and coming to a point where you are comfortable with who you are is the key to a healthy professional identity. Piaget is well known for his stage theory of child cognitive development. One of the concepts he talked about was the schema. Schema is a cognitive model, a mental representation of the world. It's a way to organize knowledge in our brains. And he described how children would construct an understanding of the world around them and organize this understanding in schemata or schemas. And whenever they experience something that is not aligned with what they already know, they have to either adapt or adjust their existing schema. And they would do this in one of two ways. They would either assimilate, which means that they find a way to align what they are experiencing with what they already know without changing what they already know, or they have to accommodate, which means they have to change their internal model or the schema of what they know to fit with the new reality. And this seems pretty abstract, but let's take a look at an example to illustrate this better. So let's take a look at this terrific carton by Bill Watterson uh, to try and understand uh, how children have schemas. And when they face an experience which challenges the schema, how they respond. So here he is with his um, with Hobbes and uh, they are about to make a toast. So Kelvin says, watch, you put bread into this slot in this box and push down this lever. And in a few minutes, toast pops up. And up till this point, everything is fine. But the next slide displays what their schema was. So Hobbes says, wow, where does the bread go? And Calvin says, beats me, isn't that weird? So clearly their internal schema was that when you put something that looks like bread into a box, it should still be in there. And it does not account for the new experience of a toast coming out of the box being the same as the slice of bread that was put in there. And at some point, they will learn that it is the same thing. And that at that point, they would have uh, accommodated uh, their internal schema to fit with the new reality. As children grow up, they build a very rich library of internal complex schemata. This was best described by the philosopher Jiddu Krishnamurti. He, at a very young age, was selected or identified as a future leader and was trained and brought up with that specific expectation. 
it was only as a young adult that he actually recognized the huge role that these expectations and external influences had on his beliefs and thoughts. He said that society is always trying to control, to shape, to mold the thinking of the young. From the moment that you are born and begin to receive impressions, your father and mother are constantly telling you what to do and what not to do and what to believe and what not to believe. He also said that the highest form of human intelligence is to observe yourself without judgment. This is very similar to what we call mindfulness now. He knew that to be truly free, one has to become self-aware and recognize these external influences and learn to see what you would truly want for yourself. So we just saw how Jiddu Krishnamurti talked about external influences that shape our identity. So let's take a look at three of the domains that influence our identity. There is the individual, the relational, and the social. Relational is kind of pretty obvious. It's your friends, family, mentors, co-workers who are uh, closely connected to you and often play a huge role in your thinking. Social groups that you belong to, your peer groups, and um, your status within that group influences your identity. And these are the external influences that uh, Krishnamurti talked about. But most importantly, these help to shape your internal schemata. And then it's really up to you how external experiences will influence whether you assimilate or accommodate these internal schemata. So for example, uh, let's take uh, uh, an example of smoking. So at a young age, let's say you learned either from friends or family that smoking is bad. And maybe, and again, this is hypothetical, uh, there was an internal schema that you have that a uh, person who smokes is either illiterate about the harmful effects of smoking or does not have the willpower to quit smoking. And maybe you uh, encounter a roommate in college who is very bright and started smoking in high school and is not able to give up even though he's trying very, very hard. And you realize that as you talk to him, that smoking is addicting. And uh, it's not just a matter of willpower. And now you adjust that internal schema that you have about smoking and add the addiction potential and how much it takes to quit smoking. So we develop these internal schema initially with external influences. And then as we become older, we learn to look at our internal schema, examine them in the light of external experiences, and hopefully we can accommodate them to help us develop our identity further. So let's take a look at a real simple example of how this plays out in real life using Freud's concept of uh, id, ego, and uh, superego. So id is your very primitive instinct. And uh, this is like a very young child gets hungry and says, I just need to eat right this second. And then as you grow up and you get influenced by family, friends, and society, you have your superego, which says, well, you can't do that because you're right now in the middle of an important uh, meeting 
and you have to wait. And then hopefully at some point you get to the stage of where your ego is aware of both the, what the id wants, what the superego is saying, and then it makes a judgment. And you are very consciously making a decision while being aware of conflicting inputs from uh, different influences to say, you know, in this case, this is what I'm going to do and this is why I'm going to do it. And it is not automatic, but it has the result of a reflective, mindful awareness of influences. As we move into our professional training, there are additional influences that help shape and form our professional identity. Firstly, we come and bring with us our professional values, attitudes, mor morals, and beliefs that we saw earlier, which are formed by social and relational influences and how we accommodated our internal schema to match those. Now we see additional influences like uh, legal rules and principles and uh, professional ethics and codes of practice. And all these are highly relevant to the professional training of physicians. And somewhere in the intersection of this is the development of your professional identity. Another concept that helps us understand this better is described by Irving Goffman several decades ago. He wrote the book on called The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. And what he describes is a concept of impression management. And he also describes this concept of front stage and backstage. So essentially, every day in our lives, anytime we are with at least one other person, we are practicing impression management, where we behave or act or appear or look appropriate to the expectation of that social situation. And that is the front stage. And it's only when we are completely alone and not observed by anyone is when we are truly ourselves. And uh, one way to think about this is we wake up every morning, we are in our pajamas, hair is unbrushed, teeth are not brushed, but before we leave the house, we get dressed appropriately and brush our teeth, take a shower, etc. And we are doing this to meet the expectations of us being members of a society. So we do the same thing when we are meeting with friends and we do the same thing when we come to work in our professional setting, which in this case is a medical school or clinic or hospital. Thus, as soon as we put on the white coat, we take on the expectations of being part of the medical profession. And everyone who sees us in the white coat also expects us to behave in a particular manner. And being aware of this is critical to the development of our professional identity. This conscious uh, self-awareness of the connection between the front stage and the backstage between your individual and your professional self is a key step in professional identity formation. Imagine uh, you are on a plane and uh, there is a medical emergency and the flight attendant uh, makes an announcement asking for a medical person on a plane to step forward. Now imagine you in high school or early college and you would not even obviously think of yourself as a medical person and you would not imagine this announcement applies to you. And uh, as you progress through medical school and residency, at some point you'll realize that this announcement could apply to you to the point that 
a few years after residency, you won't even think about it, it's automatic. And you have internalized the identity of a medical professional. And you don't have to think about yourself in this situation as either a non-medical person or a medical person. And one of the interesting things is how you get to this particular point. And hopefully, in the professional identity formation journey, as you experience different events, it's not automatic that you internalize these concepts, but you pause to think about whether you should or you should not, and how it fits with your internal schema. And this is something that we will look at next. So let us take a look at uh, Bob Keegan's theory of adult development. Keegan is a psychologist at Harvard who was heavily influenced by Piaget and Erickson. And he describes several levels of uh, adult development. And key to understanding these concepts is what he means by transformation and what he means by uh, subject and object. And uh, we'll take a look at what these mean so to better understand how we progress through these levels of adult development. To understand Keegan's theory, you have to understand mindfulness or self-awareness. This is the concept that you are able to almost detach yourself from your thought processes, stand outside yourself and examine them and analyze them. And as you are able to do this at successive levels, it helps you progress along the journey of adult development and professional identity formation. As you become self-aware, it helps you transform concepts, ideas from the subject to the object. Subject means that the concepts, we are so attached to them, they're so close to us that they control us. We cannot examine them or reflect on them. Take for example, religion. Most ch children follow the same religious practices as their parents, and as they get older, they are possibly able to detach themselves from the concept of religion and really examine whether they are religious or not and which religion they want to follow. Thus far, we have seen from the work of Krishnamurti, from Goffman and Keegan, how we are so close to certain concepts, which are our internal schema, that we tend to do these things automatically without being even aware of what is driving our decisions. And one thing that we would love all of us to develop is that ability to be self-aware when you're making a decision, why you're making that decision. Is it because this is what you learned from your parents or family or from your social peer groups or because this is the professional code of conduct. Let's imagine a situation where a person is thinking of buying a convertible and he thinks about this particular very sporty convertible and uh, imagine what is going through his mind that is driving him uh, to make a decision towards buying this particular car. And you could say he thinks it would be fun. It, it would look real cool. He likes the sun on his face, the wind in his hair, that people will think he's rich or that it is flashy. On the other hand, he could be looking at this car and in this case, some thoughts going through his brain could be, it would give me great mileage. Yes, he could get the sun and the wind. It would look cool to a certain population. 
it would have reduced emissions and he would be looked on as being socially responsible. Again, a lot of times people make decisions about things like buying a car and they may be for others. For example, in the first case, thinking that people will think he's cool or in the second case, thinking that people will think he's responsible. On the other hand, it may be truly internal decisions like one car would be great and fun to drive and this person really loves to drive or that this person truly believes uh, on reducing his impact on global warming and wants to make a decision for that specific purpose. So the point of this story is we often make decisions automatically because of our internal schema, which we have developed based on external influences. And as we go through our profession, we get externally influenced by legal and social and uh, uh, codes of conduct and professional ethics. And it is very important to stop and think before automatically adopting certain practices. Everything you see, anytime it clashes with your internal schema of what it means to be a good doctor, you should pause and take a second to reflect on whether this is something that you would want to do, what is driving you to do it, and whether you should accommodate your internal schema to adopt what you just saw. So Keegan's stages of adult development talk about how initially our needs are focused on our own uh, wants and we are focused on ourselves. Then we start getting shaped by our family and peers and we tend to do what they expect of us or what the society expects of us. And eventually we start doing what the profession expects of us. And at some point we start to determine what we truly believe we are and what we believe. And we are able to pause and look at what is driving our various decisions. And at that point, we have reached the final stage of Keegan's adult development. So the goal of the professional identity development journey is to become aware of who you truly are and you are able to step outside yourself, be aware of yourself and you are making yourself object instead of a subject. You clearly understand what you believe in, you understand what you want and you understand why you want it, the motivations for your actions and then you understand whether they are driven by your beliefs and wants and eventually you become confident and comfortable with who you truly are. So now let us turn our attention to competence, which is roughly defined as the ability for a person to do something successfully and efficiently, the focus being on being able to do it. And in clinical education, this is often assessed by what is uh, become quite famous, the Miller's Pyramid. And often the journey that a person takes to competence is by first knowing what to do, then knowing how to do it, then being able to show a preceptor how to do it, and then being able to do it on their own without any supervision. So again, uh, going back to some cartoons to help illustrate the point, uh, Let's take a look at uh, this cartoon of uh, Tarzan and Jane. So here is Tarzan. He's in the jungle, swinging on the vines, practicing how he would introduce himself to Jane. So he starts off by saying, okay, how do you do? My name is Tarzan and I believe you are known as Jane or allow me to introduce myself. I am Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle, and you? Or you must be Jane, I'm Tarzan, 
it's a pleasure to meet you. So finally, after practicing and rehearsing this, which shows he knows how to do this, he lands on the branch and me finally meets Jane. And he goes, me, Tarzan, you, Jane. And then he realizes that he has goofed up. So clearly, he knew how to do it, but he had a problem with actually doing it. And uh, this is the concept of competence. And let's now tie it up with how this relates to professional identity. So how does the Miller's Pyramid relate to professional identity formation? So if you go back to the previous slide, what we said was the key difference in competence was, or the final step of competence was not just showing your preceptor that you can do something, but doing it when you are alone by yourself with the patient. And go back to our previous discussion about Goffman and impression management and the front stage and the backstage. And what Goffman said was, when you are on the backstage, you are your authentic self and you do what you would do without any social or peer expectations. So imagine that the peer, uh, the pyramid actually looks like this. And uh, the final stage is actually not just doing something because of social expectations or professional expectations, but actually being that very person. And that journey from knowing what to do to doing it to actually being that person is the journey of professional identity formation. So let us summarize what we have covered so far. We started off by talking about uh, Piaget and his concepts of childhood development and the concept of uh, schema. Next, we covered uh, some of the external factors that influence our identity. We talked about Krishnamurti and we talked about uh, how Goffman perceived uh, how we do impression management based on external expectations. We then looked at the related concept of mindfulness. Again, Krishnamurti telling us the highest level of intelligence is becoming aware of ourselves and how this is a key step in professional identity formation. And we moved on to Keegan's concept of adult development and how self-awareness helps us transform from uh, objects or concepts from the subject to the object. So we can kind of step outside and analyze them and decide whether to adopt them or not. And then we finally looked at the concept of competence and being doing something when we are alone and becoming that person who automatically does those things. And one thing I would like to stress at this point is that while we want to get to the point where we do things automatically that are part of our professional identity, the journey to get to that point is should not be automatic. It should be a very thoughtful, self-aware, reflective journey so that every time you have an experience that causes cognitive dissonance with what you believe and what you are seeing, you pause, you reflect, and you decide whether to adopt that, modify that, or reject that. And that journey has to not be automatic. But then you get to the point where when you have that emergency on a plane, it is automatic. You don't have to think, but you get up and rush to help. So once you get to this level, you become aware of yourself and become comfortable with yourself. And this is the concept that was very, very well portrayed by Thay, um, a Vietnamese bank who said, to be beautiful means to be yourself. You don't need to be accepted by others. You need to accept yourself. And the point is that you get to a, a level, this is the final level of Keegan's adult development, where every time you have to make a decision, 
you are able to be aware of what is driving your decision, you can see that the profession would like you to do something while the society may want you to do something else. And you are able to consciously make a decision that you would be comfortable with. And hopefully there is no friction at that point with who you are and what the expectations are from outside. And when you get to this point, you have reached the final stage of professional identity formation. Hope you enjoyed this presentation and uh, uh, you can read up more about all the um, philosophers who I've mentioned here, um, hopefully carry on this journey yourself.